Welcome to the Money Answer Show with host Jordan Goodman. Whether you are starting out, deep into your retirement, or somewhere in between, the Money Answer Show has the know-how to help you. Now here's your host, Jordan Goodman. Welcome to the Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Kelly Wright. He is the managing editor at Investment Quality Trends, uh, which is based in California. Uh, And he's also the portfolio manager for IQ Trends Private Client Asset Management. Uh, His newsletter website is iqtrends.com. Welcome to the Money Answer Show, Kelly. Hey, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Just give us a brief history. I know that Geraldine Weiss used to run IQ Trends, but just give us a brief history of yours before you took it over and where you've been now. Sure. Um, I I started out in the industry uh, back in 1984. Um, I was first with a a private little boutique down in La Jolla, uh, California, and then I moved over to uh, the old Dean Witter uh, Reynolds, which is, I guess, now part of Morgan Stanley. Um, I was with Dean Witter, then did a a short stint uh, in the banking industry. and then started my first firm in 1991 as a uh, fee-only uh, registered investment advisor. And uh, was just running my practice until 2002 when Geraldine asked me to take over IQ Trends. And here we sit. Very good. So just kind of start at a broad level. What is the investment philosophy of IQ Trends compared to all the other investment newsletters out there? Well, Jordan, to keep it simple, um, we view investing as a business, and we think that the sole purpose of investing is to earn a return on investment. So from that standpoint, um, of all the assets that are available to us, we're most comfortable with common stocks, uh, especially common stocks that meet a, a criteria that Geraldine developed back in the 60s. Um, to discern quality from, uh, we'll just call it non-quality. And then um, we ascertain what the repetitive areas of dividend yield are for each of those stocks that meet our qualitative um, filter so that we know when to buy, when to hold, and when to sell. So basically what we're trying to do is just identify really good, high-quality stocks and then also identify when they offer good value so that we can make the three most important decisions that all investors have to make is what do I have to buy, when do I buy it, how long do I hold it, and when do I sell it? Yeah. Now, you start off by saying investing is a business and should be treated as such. Are you saying a lot of investors don't really treat it as a business? What's the difference in mindset? in treating it as a business as opposed to a hobby? Well, you know, there's speculators and then there's investors. And, you know, just some of the culture um, that's prevalent today is that you get the sense that a lot of market participants um, think of investing as more like a lotto ticket. Um, You know, gambling, getting in, they probably don't think they're gambling. but they uh, they treat it as if they are taking bets uh, as opposed to taking a position in an operating company. And so they're just two entirely different mindsets. Um, you know, my first mentor, my first teacher was my grandfather, who was, you know, um, a person of the Depression era. And um, he finally started making some money. Um, after the depression, and then he he had to learn, you know, how to put it to work. And he wasn't a formally educated man, so but he liked to say that he he graduated from the University of Hard Knocks, and yeah. um, so he he learned all the things that you shouldn't do. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things he started impressing upon me as a young man was that uh, you work hard for your money. And if you're going to put it to work in the markets, shouldn't you do it with the same mindset as if you were going to go down on Main Street and take an interest in an operating company on Main Street? So that's basically where we're coming from. Yeah. I mean, there's two basic schools of investing. There's growth and value. You're a value investor, um, which makes sense, except the last 11 years or so has been super dominated by growth companies. So 
a lot of the, the best companies out there, Facebook, uh, Google, Amazon, that have been spectacular, do not pay dividends. So are you missing something by not uh, getting involved in companies that don't pay dividends? Not really. Uh, if, if you take a look at our track record, um, Mark Holbert, who runs Holbert Ratings, has been following us since 1986. And, you know, you, you take a look at pretty much any time frame, Jordan, and um, it seems that, you know, we're, we're kind of running around 11.5% compounded annual return. Um, over the last 20 years, um, a simple little portfolio that we put together every January uh, has outperformed the S&P 500 by over five uh, basis points a year. So, uh, you know, we might not uh, get in on the on the hot stocks like that, but um, no, we haven't missed out on anything. We're doing just fine. Why do you think growth has done much, so much better than value for such a long time? Normally there are cycles when value comes back, and do you see that changing now? Well, you know, Jordan, we've been in a really interesting period since 2009 when uh, the Federal Reserve and the other central banks around the world embarked on what they called extraordinary measures, and most of us refer to as QE, which is, of course, an abbreviation for quantitative easing. And for much of the last, you know, 10 years or so, you really haven't had to be smart. You just had to be in uh, because you've had a, a very uh, friendly and benign Fed, and the wind has been at your back. Um, and so you could you could be a passive investor and you could just buy indexes and have done well. Um, what we've learned, though, in our 54 years is that uh, there is such a thing as reversion to the mean. And uh, I suspect that one day uh, we will see a reversion and all those passive investors that piled into indexed ETFs, are going to find that they're a dual-edged sword and it cuts both ways. Uh, whereas, you know, if you limit your investment choices to just really high-quality companies, when they offer good present value, meaning when their their price is low and their dividend yield is at a repetitive, multi-decade um, high area, uh, more than likely you're you're going to ride out. Uh, any of the nasty things that Mr. Market can throw at us from time to time. Whereas if you're in an indexed ETF, um, you're going to ride that thing all the way down. I mean, some would say that the index phenomenon is almost like feeding on itself. The indexes are going up because a lot of people are putting money into index funds that have to buy the same stocks that go up. So there's just cash flow continues to go into those, not only with directly, but indirectly, like 401k plans, just a constant cash flow into the same stocks that's kind of feeding on itself. You, you think that's not going to run its course is what you're saying? Well, I'm, I'm just saying that it, at some point, um, valuations are going to get so extreme that even the institutions throw in the towel and say, you know, we're, we're going to have to protect ourselves. So um, the ca what I call the casual participant, which is – you know, the person that does have a 401k or some kind of a qualified plan through their company, you know, most of the uh, options that they have are in uh, indexes or uh, in other, you know, type of asset classes, which are, are similar to indexes. Um, and it's, it's going to stop working. The, the same thing, I guess, Jordan, let me put it this way. <clears throat> Yeah, th there are such things as cycles. We, we, we've had a really long and unusual one um, because of extraordinary measures. But all cycles run their course because, you know, when everybody stops, starts doing the same thing, uh, eventually it stops working because you get too many people on one side of the boat and it starts to list. Yeah. Um, you know, so this, this too shall pass. You say that the cash dividend is the most important fundamental measure of return on investment. Uh, as it's immediate, as opposed to long-term growth. So why is that that cash dividends are the most important way to, to value stocks, when a lot, a lot of very successful stocks, again, don't have and probably will never have dividends? Oh, this is true. Um, <clears throat> and not to take anything away from those companies. I mean, God bless them. <clears throat> Pardon me. But um, the thing about cash is, yes, it's return on investment. It's immediate return on investment. And the thing about dividends that's really important 
is that number one, it, it shows that the company is profitable. In other words, you, you cannot pay from that which you do not have. You know, so many of my peers, they, they, they spend so much time talking about earnings and going over and um, balance sheets and income statements, et cetera. And if you want to know, Jordan, whether your company is making any money or not, look at its dividend history. If they've got a long, long-term long track record of paying dividends consecutively every quarter, then you know that the company's making money. Number two, uh, a rising dividend trend tells you that whatever the company is doing, they're doing successfully because they're continuing to increase their earnings because uh, without increased earnings, you couldn't increase your dividend. And then um, lastly, you know, dividends do provide a bit of a floor of safety underneath the stock, um, particularly if you purchase them correctly at um, a low price, high dividend yield area. Uh, the market can correct, the market can get, even go into a bear market, but the likelihood that a, a company that was purchased rice based on its historic dividend yield um, is going to hang in there and, and is not as going to decline as much as companies that don't provide a return to the investor vis-a-vis dividends. This was the whole idea of your book, the original book, Dividends Don't Lie, and then the following book you did called Dividends Still Don't Lie. Is that the basic concept behind those books? Pretty much. Yep. It hasn't really changed a lot since 1966. Um, <clears throat> it, it was Geraldine's original interpretation of, of what's known as the dividend yield theory, which is the single most important thing you can know about a company is its um, its cash dividend, its, its cash dividend history, and its cash dividend trend. Those three things can tell you pretty much really everything that you need to know about a stock uh, in order to make a, a good decision on whether to buy it or not. I mean, what's changed from that time is that interest rates are a lot lower than they were. I mean, when you had interest rates in the late 70s and 80s and double digits, and now the 10-year treasury is at 1.5%, dividends look a lot more attractive and the stocks have a higher valuation just because the comparison looks worse. Is that a reason why dividend stocks have done well? Well, that and just a simple fact that th there's a lot of folks who, you know, are just starving for income uh, and they haven't been able to get it in the fixed income market or in the banking market vis-a-vis -vis CDs like they normally did. Um, matter of fact, I would suggest, Jordan, that there's probably a, uh, a rather large cohort of um, market participants who probably would have never bought a stock in their life except for the fact that the dividends were the only place to find income. So, um, yeah, uh, dividends have become much more attractive in this uh, very low interest rate environment, that's for sure. Yeah, very good. We're going to take a break. Uh, this is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Kelly Wright. He's the managing editor of Investment Quality Trends Newsletter. He's also the chief investment officer at IQ Trends Private Client Asset Management. You can find out more about him and his newsletter at his website, iqtrends.com we'll be back after this you've been listening to the money answer show with jordan goodman if you have a question for jordan or his guest please call us now at 866-472-5790 that's 866-472-5790 now back to jordan welcome back to the money answer show this is jordan goodman your host my guest this hour is kelly wright he's the managing editor of the investment quality trends newsletter you can find out more at his website, iqtrends.com. Welcome back to the show, Kelly. Thank you so much. Tell people what they can find at iqtrends.com. We, we publish twice a month on or about the 1st and 15th, and we cover roughly uh, 255 companies that meet our qualitative criteria. Um, we break them up into four different categories based on where they are uh, currently in their dividend yield and in relation to their dividend yield pattern. So the stocks that are at their, um, their low price, high yield area, that's what we call undervalued and that's where we make most of our buying um, considerations from. When they rise 10% above that, they enter what we call the rising trend. And the rising trend is basically a hold area while you're waiting for the stock to climb to its high price, low yield area that we call overvalue. And that's our, our sell discipline. That's, that's when we relinquish our hold on the stock because we've milked all the value out of it. 
And then once it rolls over from there and declines 10%, it enters what's called the declining trend. And then between a combination of uh, price decreases and dividend increases, it'll eventually get back to its high yield undervalued area. So we we put those four categories uh, in there so folks can follow their stocks. Well, we have a feature called the Timely 10, which is our 10 best ideas out of the undervalued area. Uh, every issue, um, we have some commentary uh, from yours truly, which um, depends on who you're talking to, how good it is. Um, we'll let you know what stock's upcoming uh, with dividend increases. Uh, we have a feature called Yield to Watch, where there's sometimes companies will deviate from their historical average and so we like to, to point those out and um, that's it uh-huh. and just tell us a little bit about your money management uh, the the uh, IQ trends private asset management what is your minimum and how does that all work well basically what we're doing Jordan is for those folks who don't have the time don't have the inclination or just want to concentrate on what they they love in their life uh, we will do it for them um, but basically what you read in the newsletter is how we manage portfolios we'll we'll, we'll take um, you know a, a portfolio and, and we like to hold between 25 and 30 positions um, because we're value oriented sometimes it'll take us a little while to get there um, because mr. market is not always cooperative. But once we get a portfolio together, we have pretty low turnover, maybe three or four percent a year at the most. And um, we have two platforms. One has no minimum whatsoever. We run it a lot like an ETF. Uh, it's a model portfolio that we, we manage over at uh, Folio Institutional. And then we have another uh, platform which was designed for more sophisticated situations like a really complex trust or family limited partnerships. That does have a million dollar minimum and that starts at 1%. Uh, The one I mentioned previously is three quarters of a percent uh, per year. And that's all in soup to nuts, no additional fees. What is the typical holding period for when a stock you're buying an undervalued that it gets to overvalued? If you plot it on a bell curve, it's running about three and a half years, which means about half of our our universe will cycle faster than that, and the other half cycles slower than that. And there there's some industries that have very long cycles, like pharmaceuticals. Um, they can take up to nine years, but on average, it's about three and a half or so. And you're diversifying amongst many different industries, is that right? We we try. Um, you know, it's it's tough to find stocks that can meet our criteria, uh, Jordan. Um, you know, there's over 7,000 publicly traded companies, and there's only about 350 that that um, pass our qualitative screen. And then we take a look at each one of them individually to find out what the repetitive high and low dividend yields are. And, and some of them, even though they meet our qualitative uh, filter, we can't get what's called a pattern on them. We can't develop a profile. So, um, yeah, we, there's only about 255 in our universe right now, and it's uh, it's tough sledding to to find good ones. Do you normally recommend that people reinvest dividends or take dividends and build up a portfolio of other holdings? If as long as the stock's in the undervalued category, you can go ahead and use a drip or reinvest the dividends. Once it gets out of the undervalued category, it kind of defeats the purpose of the methodology, which is to only put money to work when the dividend yield is at its highest. So uh, then we recommend that you start taking your dividends in cash, and then that way you can choose, you know, whether to uh, to add shares to an existing position if it, if it comes back into value, or to find a new position to put those those dividends into. What if somebody wants to live off their portfolio, as you say, they can't make enough money in CDs or bonds to make it worthwhile. Do you have like a high yield category, maybe 6% or higher, things like real estate investment trusts or master limited partnerships or BDCs that aren't designed to grow, but designed to throw off high income? Do you have some uh, choices in that area? Uh, We cover uh, a handful of REITs. And we cover two or three um, oil and gas type um, pipeline companies. So they're, they're MLPs. 
we don't search for them though. We just search for companies that meet our, our criteria and then we can get a profile on. But for people who want to derive income from their portfolio, what we suggest is, A, you know, be very um, honest with yourself about putting together a budget of, of what you need to spend every year. And then typically what I, I tell my clients is, let's set aside your cash needs for a year in an interest-bearing money market or, or a checking account or whatever, and then let your portfolio run so that we're not constantly um, uh, generating transactions in order to meet their income needs. Uh, if we can do that once a year, we found that, number one, it's much more tax efficient, um, but it's also much more efficient on the, the management process if we can uh, try to be disciplined and, and, and set aside money once a year. But uh, th- that's how we recommend that you do it. Do you think some of those high yield categories are overvalued now because people are stretching for yield? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it don't just take utilities for example which have historically had higher yields than most operating companies you know not even discussing REITs or MLPs right now but just utilities you know since about 1929 or so through up until last year the Dow Jones utility average had kind of stayed between a 3% yield and a 6% yield um, we have since kind of cratered through that 3% yield. So that tells me that the prices of utility stocks are very, very, very high on a relative historical basis. Now moving to REITs, oh, absolutely. I mean, REITs used to be, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10%. Um, some of the ones we follow now that are really, really good companies, you're in the high threes in the low to mid fours, occasionally you'll see a 5%. So, yeah, yeah, uh, market participants are definitely stretching for income and they're driving up prices like crazy. So what would bring that down? If interest rates started rising significantly, would that hurt the valuations of these high-yield stocks? Uh, it's depending on their quality and how they derive, um, you know, their, their earnings that pays their dividends, it could. Um, my suspicion is is that you're going to see higher yields through a combination of lower prices and then a greater dividend increases. I, and, I, and I'm not saying that we're going to have a bear market. Uh, I, a matter of fact, I don't see one on the horizon. Um, <clears throat> but I do think that you'll 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 see some correction of of uh, some degree this year. I mean, this little brouhaha the last week or so is really nothing to talk about. It it, it hasn't been anything to too big at all but I mean a serious correction of you know 12 to 15 percent that could could certainly bring some yields back into an area where they're more attractive you seem to concentrate only on domestic countries com- companies do you think there are a lot of opportunities overseas as well or you just want to stay domestic uh, well you know most of the companies we follow Jordan are, are multinationals so we, we get exposure to those um, those other economies and then we do cover quite a few ADRs, which are obviously foreign companies whose shares trade on the on the New York. So um, we, we feel like we've got pretty good expo- exposure around the globe. Very good. We're going to take another break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Kelly Wright. He's the managing editor of the Investment Quality Trends newsletter. He also is the chief investment officer at IQ Trends Private Asset Management. Uh, You can find out more at his website, iqtrends.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Kelly Wright, Managing Editor of the Investment Quality Trends Newsletter. You can find out more at his website, iqtrends.com. Welcome back to the show, Kelly. Thank you, Jordan. So let's get to some specific examples now. You have what you call the Lucky 13. First of all, to describe what gets you into the Lucky 13, and then let's maybe talk about a stock that's recently joined the Lucky 13 and kind of what process you went through 
to have that uh, company join? Sure. Um, well, back in 2000, uh, Geraldine started uh, what we call the Lucky 13, and it's just 13 stocks we pick at the beginning of the year that we think is going to outperform the market over the next 12 months in a day. Um, <clears throat> we usually start working on it in November and kind of see what's there in the undervalue category, um, start digging into them taking a look at their dividend yields and see where they are, uh, you know, in relation to the historical pattern. And then we try to diversify as much as possible as we can with 13 stocks. Um, and, and that's kind of it. And then there, there's three other, there's, there's three other measures that I look at, which is kind of getting into the tall weeds with the big dogs. It's um, return on invested capital, free cash flow yield, and then a price to value ratio. Um, and we, we look at those, and, uh, th and that's how we come up with, uh, with our Lucky 13. So um, let me see. Why don't you give us an example, since you did it somewhat recently, of uh, one or two stocks that are now in the Lucky 13 and kind of why they qualified. Sure. Um, Cummins, uh, symbol of CMI. Uh, Cummins is a great company. Um, you know, they make those uh, big engines, uh, you know, for the big earth moving machines and big trucks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we like Cummins a lot because, number one, its dividend yield is within uh, the, the, the bounds of its, of its historical um, dividend yield pattern of being close to its undervalued uh, category. Um, they have a great track record of raising their dividends. Um, they've averaged at minimum a 10% annual uh, dividend increase over the last 12 years. Um, and, and that's pretty outstanding when a company can have that type of consistency. So that's something that we really like about Cummins is that, um, uh, number one, they're still very attractive on a, on a yield basis, and they tend to raise the dividend at least 10% a year. So that's something that, that we really, really like a lot. Do you also look at the macro environment? For example, trade would be very important to Cummins and selling these engines to China. And we've had this trade war and now we've got a trade piece. Is that one of the reasons why they're depressed at the moment and have a higher yield? And you think that's turning around? Um, well, I think that the trade deal is definitely going to help them going forward. But that didn't really uh, play into our uh, picking them. We're what you call bottom up stock pickers meaning that we don't really have a, uh, a macroeconomic view and then sit around and discuss which industries we think fit best with that macroeconomic view. What we look at is what is Mr. Market going to work with right now? And um, so we, we don't really care about the macro environment. If they, if they meet our qualitative characteristics that we're looking for, Jordan, They've got the high yield at a low price. They raise their dividend uh, consistently every year, and they and they raise it significantly. Those are the things we look at. So so Cummins fell into that, um, you know, into that area, and that's one of the reasons why we we bought it. Um, another one we were just discussing REITs is Simon Property Group, uh, and that symbol is SPG. Um, Simon Property Group is uh, a mall operator. Um, and a lot of people thought, uh, well, you should have seen the uh, emails and calls I got on that one. But, um, you know, Kelly, you've lost your mind. Um, you know, malls are dying, et cetera, et cetera. But um, these guys are really doing a phenomenal job of taking space that used to be dedicated to, you know, an older brick and mortar type of a company. You know, let, let's call it an apparel company. And they're opening up and, you know, they're putting in theaters and they're putting in um, things that are drawing adults and, and kids for entertainment. And so they're making them into more of a not just a, a shopping place, but a place to eat, a place to eat, to see movies, a place to go play games. You know, gaming is a huge industry. So that's one of the reasons why we like Simon Property Group. And I hope that makes sense. Uh -huh. But again, the, the reason that they're down and a value is because people don't like malls. So there's a reason why they're undervalued as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because clearly, you know, malls are dying and they're all going to go out of business. <laughs> so yeah. so they're unloved and that's why their price is low and their yield is high. 
So, um, you know, in, in that vein, here, here's another one that people think we're absolutely nuts about uh, it is ExxonMobil and the mm-hmm. X, XOM. Uh, ExxonMobil, you know, it's one of the largest, uh, oldest energy companies in the world. Um, their dividend is really right around, uh, it's in the high fours, which is phenomenal for them. Um, their, their PE is, uh, is relatively benign. Um, they, they have almost no long-term debt. Um, and it's just one that showed up on our screens and we said, wow, let's, uh, let's take a look at that. And, uh, you know, I don't know, Jordan, if energy is going to go out of, um, uh, you know, popularity, my, my guess is that's still what the world runs on. Um, but it's a great company and you can get it uh, really cheap right now. Yeah. So there's definitely a value component of all this. But are, are you looking for a catalyst to turn things around? I mean, some people are saying oil is the new tobacco and people don't want to be investing in fossil fuels as a kind of long term secular trend against uh, oil companies. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't see an economically viable alternative energy model out there right now. Something that's going to supplant fossil fuels, you know, um, maybe sometime in the future. Uh, but I think it's definitely down the road. So between here and there, um, fossil fuels are still going to be the stir that, that uh, or the star- straw that stirs the energy drink, I should say. Yes. Okay. Then you have your top 10 as well, right? How are those 10. different from the lucky 13? Well, the t- you know, the Timely 10, you know, subscribers, Jordan, um, are kind of like kids. If you give them one thing, then they want something else. So, um, you know, hey, Kelly, you know, that we, we love the lucky 13. It's done a phenomenal job. But what are we supposed to do, uh, you know, the other 11 months out of the year? And we tell them, look, we publish twice a month. You've got all these undervalued stocks to choose from. So anyway... Uh, the Timely 10 is the process that we use at our management company to uh, put together portfolios. And uh, the only difference between that and the Lucky 13, though, is that the Timely 10 has a five-year outlook. Mm-hmm. So um, some of the stocks that are in the, the Timely 10, uh, it's a little heavy on financials right now. Um, Comerica Bank, symbol is CMA. Um Great undervalued company. It's a good bank in the Southwest uh, doing a lot of mortgage lending. Um, Omnicom Group is a company that does um, uh, advertising. It's actually a a, a collection of about 1,500 um, individual niche type of advertising companies that all operate under one umbrella. Um, Just it's incredible the kind of work they do. Um, once again, undervalued, uh, great dividend yield, uh, and they raise their dividend a lot every year. Um, another one is is Cracker Barrel Old Country Stores. Um, that seems a little dull and boring to a lot of people, um, but it, it their their return on invested capital, their free cash flow yield, uh, their their current dividend yield, their payout ratio. Um, they're just, uh, you know, it's a company that just c- creates earnings and dividend increases like crazy. So, uh, you know, these are the types of companies that end up in the Timely 10. So there are also what are so-called the dividend aristocrats that have raised dividends, I guess it's like 25 years in a row. Is that something that you look at as well? You know, dividend aristocrats are kind of an interesting, uh, I mean, we're very aware of it. Um, the thing about the dividend aristocrats is, you know, a, a company can can raise their dividend like a half a cent and meet the criteria uh, because technically, yes, that is a dividend increase. Um, but there's not a uh, a value component. Meaning, with dividend aristocrats, they don't concentrate on whether the yield is high, low, or somewhere in between. Uh, if it um, and and that's something that's very important to us because, you know, we don't want to buy a stock that's moved too far away from its undervalued area. Um, but it is a great collection of companies. We follow a lot of them. Just as an index, uh, we're not a fan because there's not that 
you know, that, that value uh, part that we insist on of, of buying only at the undervalued area. Very good. We're going to take another break. Uh, this is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Kelly Wright, Managing Editor of the Investment Quality Trends Newsletter. You can find out more about his newsletter at iqtrends.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Kelly Wright, Managing Editor of Investment Quality Trends. It's a newsletter. You can find out more at his website, iqtrends.com. Welcome back to the show, Kelly. Thank you, Jordan. So you have a section where you talk about dividend increases. Is a dividend increase normally a sign that the stock is going to go up as well? If they can raise their dividend, it's going to uh, appreciate with the stock? Absolutely. You know, Geraldine wrote years ago that the single uh, the single best indicator for a rising stock price is a dividend increase. The directors are not going to uh, vote at a dividend increase unless they know that they're going to have the earnings to be able to pay it. So that's uh, that's one of the things we definitely track and something we're very interested in. So what would be two or three examples of some companies where they've had significant history of dividend increases and you expect that to continue? Oh, Lord have mercy. Yeah. Uh, let me just thumb over here real quick, Jordan, and I'll tell you. Um, there's a company called Albemarle. They make, um, it, it's a chemical company. Uh, they're in the lithium business. Their symbol is ALB. Um, Cracker Barrel, which I just mentioned, um, and that's uh, CBRL. Um, CVS Health uh, Corporation, and the symbol is CVS, have a fantastic track record, uh, as does Fastenel Company, and that symbol is F A S T. Um, Hasbro, if you've got any uh, kids, grandkids, nephews, or nieces, and they, you know, like all those Marvel movies, you know, they're off buying action figures. And uh, Hasbro, the symbol is H A S. Uh, Lowe's Company, uh, L O W, uh, McKesson Corp, uh, M C K. Texas Instruments, if uh, you're a fan of Apple, uh, watch Texas Instruments because uh, Apple gets a lot of their dumb tech from Texas Instruments, and that's a uh, symbol is TXN. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm trying to, a Boeing company, yeah, there's some uh, somebody that uh, your listeners have heard of, symbols BA. Uh, Cintas. You don't think Boeing's uh, dividend is at risk here? I don't. I think they're going to be fine. Um, I mean, they're definitely getting their head handed to them right now uh, because they've stepped in it pretty good. But that company is doing some phenomenal things beyond what they're doing in the aircraft. I mean, their their defense. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The things they're doing in defense will blow your mind. Um, but but Boeing's going to be fine. I, I wouldn't worry about them at all. Uh huh. So uh, are you looking for a rate of uh, dividend increase or just that it increases at all? Uh, but we like to see something significant, um, you know, uh, at least one and a half, two percent dividend increase. Um, but if you can get into the, you know, close to 10 percent a year, oh, that's that's something that we really get excited about. And, and especially if you can average at least 10 percent a year over a significant period of time, that's uh, the, the, it just doesn't get any be better than that. You know, Nike. Uh, the apparel footwear and apparel company Nike is one. They just, man, they they just crank out a dividend like like there's no tomorrow. Uh, yeah. How about um, special dividends? Uh, typically at the end of the year, is that something you look for? Is that a, a particularly good sign of a, a strong company? Um, we don't use that in our historical uh, dividend uh, pattern calculations. I mean, they're great. We'll take them. Uh, you know, we love the cash. Thank you very much. But um, we don't put any weight on a special dividend in terms of uh, of its long term, uh, just a regular common dividend yield. Yeah. Do you like dividend funds or there are a lot of mutual funds and ETFs 
their strategy is rising dividends, the rising dividend fund. Vanguard, quite a few of them out there. Has, has that been a good way to go if you don't want to do individual stocks? If you don't want to do individual stocks, it, it, it's better than nothing. The, the only thing that I would warn against is that there's a lot of times those companies, yeah, they're, they're great at raising their dividends, but their price does not represent good value. And so, you know, you're, you're buying oftentimes a company that's already 20, 25, 30 percent above its, its, its historical undervalued area. And so then if the market does hit a soft patch or we do have a nasty correction or a bear market, you know, the likelihood is that, you know, those companies are going to move back down toward their undervalued price. Um, so, but in the absence of uh, not having the ability, the time, or inclination to buy individual stocks, yeah, it, it's a good alternative. What happened to your portfolio in 2008, 2009 when the market took a big hit? How much less did your portfolio go down than the averages? A lot less. I think at our worst point, we were down about 22%. Um, and then we made it all back by June or July of 2009. Wow. So if something like that were to happen again, you think the dividends would kind of cushion the downside? Oh, yeah, no question about it. And, you know, in, in 1987, um, you know, on October 19th, when the Dow was down 25, uh, you know, we were down 12. We still ended up 1987 in the black. And the first quarter of 1988 was one of the biggest quarters we've still ever had in history. You know, the, the, the great thing about quality, Jordan, is that yeah, I mean, if the market dumps, you pull the when you pull the plug in the bottom of the bathtub, all the toys start to float down. But the thing about high quality companies that have great dividend histories is, look, all the institutions have these buy programs. You know, they they call them the Armageddon list. And you know, when when certain stocks start hitting certain uh, dollar prices and dividend yields, these computers kick in and start buying them. So. We don't get really too worked up about corrections or bear markets. Actually, you know, a lot of my friends tell me that, uh, you know, that I have issues because I kind of like those times because that's when there's phenomenal amount of value and you can just go in and clean up, put a ton of money to work, buy all kinds of phenomenal companies at just really super attractive prices and yields. And um, so, yeah. Don't, don't be afraid of those times. Uh, that, that's when you should be shopping. In about two minutes we have left, just kind of sum up why this is the best way to uh, invest your money as opposed to going for the hot growth companies to, to do the dividend strategy we've talked about. It's, it's a, a consistent, safe way to protect your principal, but while also growing your, your capital and, and your, your income stream. And really, at the end of the day, Jordan, that, that's what investing is all about. It's, it's putting yourself in a position to be able to, to meet your needs, either your needs or someone else's needs at some point in time. Um, and, and if you want to be in that position where you know that the money is going to be there, you know, this is the safest, most consistent, surest way that we know how to do it. I mean, you, you maybe you'll get lucky and you'll catch lightning in a bottle a couple of times. And if you do, God bless you. You know, great for you. Um, but the people that can do that consistently are very, very, very few and far between. So um, what we do is often considered vanilla. Uh, some people call it dull and boring. And you know what? Um, that's fine with me because, you know, we do our 11 and a half percent a year. You do that year in and year out, and uh, you're going to be fine. Very good. Well, thanks so much. My guest this hour has been Kelly Wright. He's the managing editor of the Investment Quality Trends newsletter. Uh, you can find out more about all of what he does at his website, iqtrends.com. Thanks for being a great guest on the Money Answer Show, Kelly. Jordan, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Great. Thanks so much, and we'll be back next week with another edition of the Money Answer Show. Goodbye for now. Thank you for joining Jordan Goodman and the Money Answer Show. If you have a question for Jordan, please visit his website at www.moneyanswers.com. And be sure to tune in every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Voice America Business. See you next week.